Welcome to the third edition of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is Mike Jokum. With me is my co-host and soon-to-be technical guru, Jess Baker. Woo, yeah. This is the holiday cheer version, so get ready to uh, get your little break from all your family uh, gatherings and get, get your racing news in. Yes, if you're in the car on the way to a family gathering, hopefully this gives you a little bit of cheer before you might be stuck with your in-laws. Where should we start, Jess? Oh, man, where should we start? It was uh, kind of another interesting week in news. Uh, some things coming out from IndyCar about um, you know more testing for the people who did not get to test. I think that's kind of cool. And uh, the, the points change is also an uh, interesting topic to talk about. Yeah, so the the testing is a good one, especially because you know we we touched on it last week after uh, you know touching on on Marco and and Bourdais more vocal than others about complaining about it. Um, I think it's great, you know, an extra day is is fair. I know you know plenty of people online are saying, well, they're sharing the data with everybody. Sharing the data is great, but it doesn't give you a feel for how the car is going to handle on the track. Um, So, you know, even if it's just uh, four or five hours of, you know, shaking down basic setups and, and, you know, what the car is going to do in different situations, uh, you know, it's definitely, uh, you know, definitely helpful. I'm I'm sure uh, certain drivers might still complain and say, well, it's not fair. The other guy's got more days. I'll, I'll put money on it now that we hear that at some point next year. But, uh, you know, I think IndyCar and and Jay Fry are are actively listening and and took that into account. Yeah, I like that they did. Um, and and like you said, I am sure we will hear that you know so and so didn't get as much time as this driver did. Um, that's just typical. Um, everybody's kind of got to have something to complain about. But I think it's I think it's more than fair um, that they get. They get a little time. They get to make sure that all the electronics are working since those are all new this year. Um, So I I think it's a. I think it's overall it's a good thing for the drivers. Yeah, and I did want to set the record straight on one thing. I saw a bunch of people talking about online is how did AJ Foyt Racing and Tony Kanan get us a day in there? Uh, They worked out an agreement with IndyCar to take that last day of testing from Spencer Piggott and Ed Carpenter. So it was not, uh, you know, there was no bribe being exchanged um, unless you have some sort of better conspiracy theory out there. The fact is, it was just an agreement that was arranged, and Tony Kanan was very happy with with his testing. So, you know, listen, I, I think especially AJ Foyt Racing needs all the help it can get right now, and if that's just one extra day, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference. No, I agree. Um... I don't think that it's it's really going to push the needle one way or the other, but I'm sure that we will hear that it did. Yeah, I'm um, listen, you know, David Malshar on Motorsport wrote that their new technical director said that the Foyt team is following an extremely aggressive development program this off season. So, you know, listen, we've we've heard the same thing uh the last couple years, you know, revamp of the drivers, revamp of the technical team, revamp of the engineers. Um, but I really do hope that you know maybe that uh, you know this is what they need to get the get you know, get everything turned around and be competitive again because I think the IndyCar paddock would be a much more interesting place with AJ Foyt being competitive and maybe getting in arguments with other people instead of just his own drivers. And I think for the sport overall, if Foyt did have some measure of success, um, it would start bringing some fans back that may have kind of wandered away. Um, so I think it'd be I think it'd be good overall. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And the more the more teams you have that are competitive, the better overall it's going to be. You know, it's already you know on a week in week out basis. You can kind of predict the winner at some tracks, but for the most part, you, you don't know who the winner is going to be like uh, some other open-wheel racing sports. Um, so yeah, moving on, you mentioned the points change for the Indy 500 qualifying. 
And this might be the thing I'm most excited about this week, more so than driver announcements or anything. Um, a quick recap. Now the only people who get Indy 500 qualifying points are the guys who finish in the Fast 9. First place gets you ninth, all the way down to ninth place gets you one point. No more points you know, for, fit, for qualifying 33rd. Now, I might bring this up in my pit lane pitfall later. My my opinion on it is it's it's fantastic. You know, it's it it puts a premium on qualifying high. Does it mean that some guys might not worry about it if you're not in the championship hunt? Sure, but if you're a guy like Scott Dixon or Will Power or anybody on Penske or Ganassi um, or in the top five or top eight in the championship standings come the Indy 500, those extra points are, are huge, as we saw you know, a couple of years ago with Dixon winning on a tiebreaker. You know, New Garden had a close battle there until the end this year. Uh, so every point counts, and I think that you will see people being maybe even more aggressive now that you, know, you only get points for the first nine positions. Uh, I saw a lot of people out there saying, well, you know, why am I going to gamble for points and have a potential uh, Sebastian Bourdais type injury if I can qualify 13th and just get in the race? When in all reality, points are what's more important, in my opinion. I'll leave it open to you. Um, yeah, I mean, points are important, especially for those guys who are going to be... Um, running a whole season so i think those guys will want to fight more for the top nine positions um the one-offs who are only doing the 500 i could see them being a little less inclined to care about the extra points um but i think overall it's a good change um like we talked about before i'm actually really glad that they are doing it in a group of three because like I said you know it's, that's kind of tradition yep. with the 500 yep. it, it needs to be something to do with a group of three there um, so I was glad to see that I'm glad to see that they're not um, going too crazy with the points I mean I think nine for getting the bowl is is plenty um, so I I like the change and um, you know I don't really see why people are kind of up in arms about it yeah, I mean, I get it. You know, somebody like, uh, you know, Pippa Man or these guys who are doing a one-off race might not care about qualifying in the top nine because the points don't make a difference in the grand scheme of things. But for the 22 or 23 or 24 full-time drivers that you have, points mean everything. So if you can put a premium on points, I think that's a recipe for uh, an exciting qualifying day, especially when you consider... Um, that we may be very close to getting back, in, back into the uh, bumping game this year. Fingers crossed on that. Yes, I, I saw uh, an interesting graph the other day. Right now we're at 31 confirmed full-time, and that's still with some drivers. Danica saying that she has a ride. Uh, you know, she is not listed in, in the... I'm sorry, she is listed in the confirmed here. So we have potential, if every team out there added one more car, to have 40 drivers. Obviously, that's not going to happen. So, hypothetically, I think you could see 34 or 35 yeah, pretty easily. Yeah, I think um, I think 34 or 35 would, would definitely be an easy number to hit. Um, I just hope that it happens. <laughs> um I mean, man, it would be so nice to see some bumping for the first time in a while. Yeah, I think especially, you know, with, uh, you know, hopefully IndyCar does something cool like being able to, you know, get a new TV contract where they can stream qualifying and whatnot online and open it up to a, an even bigger audience in the future. Being able to get bumping back this year probably means you have it even more so next year once teams are... You know, have a full season under their belts with this new, uh, I'm going to call it DW18 car. Um, yeah, I think it would just be another way to continue to grow the sport. 
yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely trending in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of which, trending in the right direction brings to mind the fact something I read this week that I don't know if it was really publicized too much was both that uh, you know rookie Zach Veach and Jack Harvey both signed multi-year contract um, with their respective teams for you know the next. I know Veach is a three-year. Uh, Harvey said multi-year, so I don't know if that's two year or three year. Um, but in a day and age where we have guys who are rookies for one year and then uh, are never heard of again, being able to give these guys a few years, uh, you know, to really grow and mature, you know, we saw how it worked with, uh, you know, Joseph Newgarden, and and we're seeing how it's it's going to continue to work for Ed Jones. I think is is really awesome. And, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, sponsor workings or team workings or a combination of both. I know uh, one cool thing I read this week was teams are starting to hire people who their sole job is, you know, sponsor relations and, you know, finding new ways to get new sponsors and, and different things like that. And um, I think it's, it's, again, you know, a great step in the right direction. Yeah, we can only hope that it continues. Um, I think that it's only fair to give these young guys more than one season because, you know, that first season, honestly, they're just learning. They don't know what they're doing. Um, they have to learn the car. They have to learn the team. I don't think it's fair to uh, kick him out after one year, so to speak. I think, you know, it's, it's only fair to give him a fair shot. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and yeah, especially for somebody like Zach Veach, who you know did a couple races last year, one for Ed Carpenter and the Indy 500 for for Foyt, um, but really has been out of a, a seat full time for a couple of years to get a three year deal. Um, you know, sh- goes to show how much his sponsors and his team believes in him. But uh, it's overall, really, really awesome to see. All right, so moving on, what do you think about the uh, the six confirmed cars for the 500 at Andretti? It took me about four times of looking at that graphic that they tweeted out to figure out that that's what it actually meant, and I don't think I'm the only one who was in that boat. Um, I think it makes Carlos Munoz automatically a race contender uh, for the win. I mean, every year he was at Andretti, he was, you know, Finished second his rookie year. Finished second to Rossi two years ago, and um, you know if it wasn't for Rossi's fuel saving magic, you know we're talking about Carlos Munoz as a race winner, and you know maybe is in a different position uh, instead of struggling at Foyt last year. Uh, so he's he's a, a hell of a racer. You know he really opened a lot of people eye of eyes his rookie year with the you know how low he drove on 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 the oval going in through the corners. Um, listen, they did it with six last year, and for the most part, all six were competitive. I think they can do it again this year. I am really excited to see Carlos come back. Um, I think the thing that struck me the most about him was um, his rookie year at the 500 uh, when he did finish second and he got out of the car and he was crying because he didn't win. Um, he knows what it means to win the 500, and, and that, to me, is just absolutely amazing. Um, I think he's definitely going to be a contender, um, and, man, it's going to be fun to watch him. Yeah, that's, that's very well said, and I think this could be a good year for him to do the 500 and maybe get uh, a handful of races maybe later in the season with somebody that needs a second car like uh harding racing for example just throwing out an idea there um to kind of build back that confidence that he might have lost in in the previous season at foyt and come back in in 2019 uh you know revitalizing what better way to start that than with andretti at the indy 500 yeah i think i think it definitely uh you know honestly it's hard to beat that team for the 500 right now just because they do have so much talent 
and so much going for them. Um, so it'll be really fun to watch uh, that team kind of make May happen. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to talk about the weekly poll results. Uh, I know it's a little over a week at this point from our our last episode, and we talked about is it a race car's driver a, a race car driver's duty to take pictures and sign autographs for fans. Uh, Jess and I disagreed slightly, um, and your options were yes, no, or only at events. And I was a little surprised that 45% of the 50 voters said yes, just wholeheartedly yes. Uh, and I, I had a few interesting replies saying that it's you know for the better of the sport and you know will really help IndyCar get to the next level, which I do agree. But I think you know I said on the show last week that. You know, listen, sometimes you have your game face on, you you got to get to that engineering discussion meeting, uh, and you just, you know, need to put it on hold until after the meeting. Um, that being said, obviously, you don't want to handle it like some people handle it and curse your fans out and storm off in a tizzy, but uh, I, I still am a little surprised that I didn't get more responses in the only at events category. What do you think? Um, well, I'm kind of surprised. I mean, I know with, I know what people are saying that, yes, it would further the sport, and I completely agree with that. Um, I, I never disagreed with that, but is it part of their job? Mm, no, their job is to drive the car. Um, yeah, they want the sport to do better, but at the same time, um, maybe part of the sport doing better is them doing better in the car. So um, that's that's just my opinion, and I know obviously it's it's an unpopular one, but um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Though with events, obviously, um, you you have the events specifically for it, and yeah, they should sign at those. But just all the time, every day, mm, yeah, I don't really agree with that. That's fair. I, I can't argue with that one. Um, our weekly poll this week, we're, we're about to do a slightly new holiday feature here in uh, New Year's resolutions. Just pick a driver, pick a team, pick the sport as a whole, and uh, you know, one New Year's resolution you'd like to see. Uh, I'll start it off since I'm uh, putting it uh, so I don't put you on the spot here. I would like to see guys like, uh, I know he's not a super fan favorite right now, uh, but somebody like Marco Andretti, who kind of seemed like he started to turn it around early in the year last year with, uh, you know, better efforts and results and, and practices and never really translated it over to qualifying and I think had some unlucky bounces in races. I'd like to see him get more consistent, you know, that effort needs to be there every practice, every qualifying session. Uh, don't get down on yourself if if a race doesn't go your way early on. Hell, Juan Pablo Montoya won an Indy 500, and after the first caution, was in 33rd place. Um, so crazy things happen all the time in racing, and uh, you know, if we can see a little bit more maturity from from Marco and 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 really some more, you know, overall effort and and continue to you know, grow that consistency. Um, you know, I, I, I hope he does well because, you know, like we said uh, when one of our first episodes, if the Andretti name is doing well, it's it's good for the sport. So my uh, New Year's resolution is for Marco to, uh, you know, grow that consistency. Well, I don't care about Marco, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that my New Year's resolution is for... TK. Um, I want to see TK driving more like the old TK, and I think he doesn't have any better opportunity than what he has right now um, with this new car. He's extremely excited for it, and that makes me extremely excited to see what he does because, man, I miss the starts with the old TK where he would gain 11 positions in one lap, and, you know, just, I mean, it was it was art to watch him drive. Um, so I would love to see that side of TK come back. Yeah, I, I mean, if you, you look at the guy, he's in 
you know, tip top physical condition and there's no reason why he shouldn't be racing for, you know, at least a couple more years before he decides to retire and you saw how excited he was with the the new car feeling like the old old car. Uh, I think he's primed for success. I don't know if he's going to contend for wins with AJ Foyt. That's really up to the engineering crew that we just talked about a couple minutes ago. But um, I think I think you found a good one there for your New Year's resolution. So we'll put that poll up uh, later uh, today when the episode is live. Again, the social media is at Pit Lane Parlay, P-A-R-L-E-Y. Uh, Jess, what's next? We are going to kind of have a nostalgia bit here. Um, we know the holidays, you know, it brings up a lot of memories, a lot of, oh, do you remember when? Or, you know, remember that toy? That was the best thing ever. Um, so we kind of want to talk about things we miss. Tracks we miss, drivers we miss. Um, people we've lost, and just kind of remember the good old days. You want me to start? Either way. Sure. I'm going to go with a driver first who was kind of, uh, you know, one of my first favorite drivers in Sam Hornish. Um, You know, dating all the way back to the, uh, you know, Panther Racing days when he started to become a star, and that amazing pass on the aforementioned Marco Andretti in the last uh, straightaway there before the checkered flag at the 500 uh, is still one of my top three favorite moments in racing. Um, so, yeah, I get why he switched over to the NASCAR side and why he doesn't maybe want to do one last Indy 500, but I do miss somebody who was as aggressive and as good of a driver as Sam Hornish was in his IndyCar days in the IndyCar world. Well, I'm going to throw it back just a little bit further than that, and I'm going to say that my driver I miss is Kenny Brack. Um, He was my favorite. Growing up, I loved the whole go faster stripe in his hair. Um, I just thought he had a great personality, and obviously he, uh, he had what it took to, to win races. Um, and I will never forget when he won the 500. I still have the newspaper, um, and it's actually signed by him and AJ both, so it's kind of my prized possession still. Um, but yeah, I miss Kenny. I miss his driving style, and um, it's it's unfortunate that he had his accident in Texas, and that kind of uh, kind of took away from from his career. But I I do miss Kenny. I wish he would be around more. Totally fair. Um, speaking of racetracks, you know, the kind of the track that I uh, grew up going to, uh, you know, a bunch of times before it closed down was Nathrus Speedway. Uh, you know, it was a cool little one mile oval, you know, pretty unique, nestled in uh, kind of the middle of nowhere in northeastern Pennsylvania, a quick hour and a half drive for me. Uh, I remember spending entire weekends up there for race weekends and uh you know it's really where I grew to love IndyCar growing up and uh I remember man I don't remember how old I was I was very little and being wowed by the team cool green car and and Paul Tracy and uh I thought wow that car's cool so that guy's going to be my favorite driver growing up um and uh well that that changed because Paul Tracy was a aggressive driver but and and made a lot of mistakes but i always still supported him when he was racing and uh even after the team cool green days but it was still one of my favorite cars and one of my favorite tracks so i guess that's a two for one there the track and the team cool green car all right i can see the car yeah paul tracy (laughs) is just paul tracy though so the car was was cool though i will definitely give you that um, I would say my track that I miss the most is, well, I'll, I'll do a twofer here because it's the exact same track. It's just located in two different places. Um, Michigan or Chicago land speedway. Um, I, I just love the, the high speed ovals. I think they're fun. They're crazy. Um, Chicago at night was just, you know, it, it's hard to beat a night race because the cars are, 
you know, glowing under the lights. You can see the sparks. I mean, it's just so much fun. Um, and I'm, I miss both of them. Um, I do. They were, they were fun to go to. They were uh, an easy drive from Indy here. And I just miss the, the high speed ovals. We just don't have enough, in my opinion. I know they're kind of coming back, but I still miss them. You brought up an interesting topic there in the debate on ovals coming back. I think, you know, based on reading enough of Robin Miller's weekly mailbags to know that Michigan probably will never happen. Right. Um, but, you know, Fontana in California was always a great race, even though last year it was there two years ago. Uh, it was a good race. Uh, I would love to see that back. Chicago land was always a good track. I'd love to see that back. Um, there's not, not one else that's uh, homestead in Miami would be a cool one to see back again. Um, that was always one of my favorite races to watch. So yeah, I, I don't think I would like, uh, you know, maybe all three of those to back to come back. But if we added two more races and you add another, road type course like uh you know a uh, Watkins Glen back let's say again and maybe a uh I don't know let's just say Fontana for the sake of discussion here if we added those two races back in and you know you have around 20 races in the IndyCar schedule I think that's one hell of a uh, a schedule yeah absolutely and it'll cover a lot of ground a lot of a lot of fans would be able to go to at least one race and and that would be good for the sport. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I'd love to see... I like the ovals. I know some people and you know some drivers are a little leery of them, but I think, you know, especially we'll see with the new car this year and how it handles in traffic, that you know, maybe we'll get an oval two or, ba- or two back because of the fact the new car is, uh, you know, handling a little bit of different and the pack racing won't be as uh, as dangerous. Yeah, I definitely think that the new car on an oval will be harder to do the pack racing because, um, you know, like I like I mentioned before, I think the newer guys coming up have never driven a car like this, so they would be um, a little less likely to go into a pack race. Um, but we'll see. I mean, it, it could be a thing where they catch on real quick, and it is just an amazing season of racing. Yeah, for sure. Um, speaking of ovals and uh, upcoming tests at one, the Phoenix Open test in February, IndyCar is going to be testing some sort of uh, cockpit protection shield system um, only on one car, which I think is kind of the right way to handle it. Um, but I, I think, you know, Jay Fry and the IndyCar team, again, I think I've said this in every episode now. Uh, is really handling in the, in the right way. They're not rushing into anything. Um, you know, IndyCar as a whole is is pretty safe. You know, unfortunately, things have happened uh, even with the new car, but it, in general, it's 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 safer than it's ever been. And not rushing to put a really ugly, strange-looking halo device on without you know really giving it some proper on-track testing more than a day or two here um is really the way to handle it where you you know throw it out for this open test when everybody else is going to be on the track and then either go back to the drawing board or slightly refine it throughout the season so 2019 comes and maybe you add a a smaller windscreen i know they were comparing it to uh kind of the windscreen cockpit type situation of an f-16 fighter jet uh, and that sounds pretty cool. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I think it's uh, you know not only a step in the right direction, but it's not going too far forward too fast without proper uh, research and testing and retesting and uh, retesting a third or fourth or fifth time. Yeah. Um, the team that does the development for all of the safety um, devices for IndyCar has said multiple times that their goal is to put themselves out of business, meaning that they make the car so safe that they don't have to make them any safer. Um, 
I really can appreciate that goal. Um, but like you said, I like that they're going into it kind of with an open mind. They're going into it slow because, um, you know, things do happen and maybe this particular design isn't going to help that much. So they don't want to go out and be crazy and, and put it on every car. Um, I think that speaks volumes for the way that IndyCar does look at safety. Um, and, you know, people who poo-poo racing because it's <laughs> the most unsafe sport in the world. Um, n no, it's not. It's, it's a very safe sport. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, accidents do happen. And, and you know, life is not 100% preventable. <laughs> Yeah, I think it kind of goes in line with, uh, you know, something else I read this morning and Delara and IndyCar talking about, you know, the long-term future and will this uh, DW12 chassis go past the, you know, right now they have it locked in until the end of 2020. Well, they extended another year or two and both Delara and IndyCar said, listen, why don't we wait until after the 500 this year? Let's see how this new aero kit does for the racing and does for the car and, and safety, obviously. And maybe we can wait another year or two to make changes. And um, I know that's not maybe what every fan wants to hear. But, I mean, listen, the, the DW18 chassis uh, is, is pretty sexy, uh, in my opinion, and I think in many people's opinions. Um, but also... If you can keep costs down for a couple more years, you you might get Michael Shank as a full time uh, race owner after you know him waiting so many years to to get back in the game after his um, failed attempt a couple years ago, uh, even though that wasn't his fault. Uh, and you might get another team, you know, like Junko uh, stepping up to full time with two cars, and Harding having two cars, and all of a sudden you're you have a flourishing series with. Uh, spitballing the number here, 28 cars. Um, so I think, you know, not rushing to judgment on the car as a whole or this aero screen protection is the exact perfect way to handle it. Yeah, they don't want to, they don't want to do anything crazy either. They're, you know, I think IndyCar as a whole is, is trying their hardest to make it uh, more accessible for owners to have the cars. Um, and I think that right now IndyCar is is really doing the right thing, um, both in their safety um, development and also in uh, trying to keep the cost down. I think that um, you know they're trying so hard right now, and I, I I do have to give them props for all of that. Yeah, especially when it it came to light this week uh, in Formula E. The Montreal race was canceled for next year. Uh, the Montreal's new mayor stated that it cost the city thirty-five million dollars to, you know, host a Formula E race, which uh, is, is definitely much higher than any IndyCar race, and seems to me to rival, you know, the insane costs of Formula One. Um, so, if you're the series that's able to keep costs reasonable uh, at any level, I think you're you're headed in the right direction. And that's not to knock Formula E. I think it's it's an interesting concept, and uh, I mean, despite the car sounding kind of funny, is uh, is actually the racing's pretty good. Yeah, the racing's um, the racing is very good, actually. Um, you know, a lot of those costs though come from. Um, sponsor agreements and, and things like that so maybe um you know maybe montreal will get some some people to come on board and and they'll they'll come back in a few years who knows yeah i think it's definitely possible i myself did not see the last montreal race uh, i think it was the season finale this past season uh everything i read was that it was one of the best races of the year so i would love to see it back and yeah, at some point I'll have to go back and and find footage of the race and watch it. But, um, you know, again, if if IndyCar is able to, you know, not only are they keeping costs down, uh, not to segue completely here, but you know they're opening up the car a little bit more for for development, so it's not as uh, spec racing as it as it has been. You know, they're keeping costs down, but giving people an opportunity to uh, 
you know, expand their car a little bit more, I think is, re- is, is really a great combination. Yeah, and, and it gives the drivers the opportunity to uh, set the car up a little bit more toward their driving style. Um, so I think that'll be good also in the long run. Yeah, I did like the little, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a jab, that, that somebody from Delara said about the windscreen testing. Um, it was head of R&D for uh, Delara here in the U.S., uh, Andrea Toso. Hopefully I didn't mispronounce her name that badly. Uh, she said, first, the car has no halo. End of sentence. I kind of like the way she just came out and, and said that, you know. I'm I'm definitely not a fan of the F1 Halo, not only from a look standpoint, but from a functional standpoint. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen enough of their testing with it to know exactly what it... I mean, I've seen pictures of it, and yeah, from the look standpoint, it's just absolutely atrocious. Um but as far as the functionality, I, I don't really, I can't really comment on it because I haven't seen it um, in action. But yeah, it just it's just horribly ugly. And for those of you who might not have seen it or may not watch F1, uh, just go to Google and Google F1 2018 Halo uh, and you'll see everything we're talking about and how... I don't like it, uh, but yeah, I think for the most part, the majority of the people out there, at least in the United States, seem to agree. Let's, uh, you want to do the pit lane pitfall? Yeah. yeah. Go for it. it. I'll let you start. Okay. So this week, um, you know, there's been a lot of news. There's been a lot of interesting tidbits going on and, um, I just saw something that kind of made me roll my eyes a little bit. (laughs) Um, So motorsport.com, I believe it was just today, yep, about four hours ago it looks like, they put out an article that IndyCar is planning to make a decision on its next car um, for the 2021 season by the end of next year. Um, the reason that makes me roll my eyes is can, can we see what this car is going to do before we decide on what the next car is going to be? Um, I mean, I know they want to look to the future and, and all that. And, and they even said in this article that they may keep the, the car for another year. Um, but let, let's just focus on, on getting this, uh, new body, well, like you said, we'll call it the DW18. Let's get it out and and get it going and not worry about the next one, which is a few years away. I am going to agree to disagree on this one only because in that article, I, I, I do agree with you, but they did say, listen, let's wait to really make a decision until we've seen the car this year i think the article like there's no there's no reason for them to publish anything like this right now is really my biggest issue is well if they're really not going to make a decision now what are we even writing about um so i'm going to agree with you from that that standpoint but overall if if they're going to wait to make a decision i don't think it's the worst thing obviously you know indycar has to plan for the future in some aspect otherwise it's going to be 2021 and they're going to be scrambling to uh build new cars or make a decision well i kind of agree with that part but at the same time we don't even know what this car is going to do yet so it's kind of hard to improve on this car when it's not even been run in race conditions um, and I know they're saying they're not going to make a decision until the end of next season, but it still seems a little bit soon to me. Totally fair. Can't argue that. Uh, my pit lane pitfall is going to be the people who have already complained about the new Indy 500 qualifying point system. For years since they changed the system, everybody has complained about two things. 
double points and the qualifying points. And uh, I'm not going to disagree on the on the double points. I don't really think it's necessary. But the qualifying points, tons and tons of people have complained about it. And they changed it. I think they made it a system that, that works. Obviously, that's just uh, you know, my opinion. But we have people now saying, well, there's no incentive to try to qualify higher. There is every incentive to try to qualify higher. Um, and I, I know it's the nature of the sports world, no matter what sport it is, um, that you have to have something to complain about. But um, I think in this case, if you're complaining about the change that you wanted to see happen, you should provide maybe your own solution. Not that any car is going to listen to us, but listen, Jay Fry has taken the public reaction to many things into account. So I, I maybe he would listen to you if you uh, sent him a, a Twitter message with, with what you think the point should be. I know it might be a personal gripe on this one, but you know, listen. They they listened to to many people who said that the points need to change for the for the 500 qualifying, and they made it a simpler system and one that puts a premium on qualifying high. To me, I think it's a a good compromise of not getting rid of qualifying points outside of the pole position altogether for the 500, but still, you know, making it important to qualify high. Well, like I mentioned earlier, I think. Um, and I think IndyCar is especially bad about this, and not just fans. Um, unfortunately, you know, drivers tend to say things, uh, the media tends to say things. I think that people just want something to complain about. Um, and and this week, it happens to be this, and we'll see what it is next week. But yeah, people, uh, people get what they want, and then they don't like it. Um, so I, for one, am, am glad with the change. I think it's a good change. Um, and like I said earlier, I think it will, uh, make the people who are full-time drivers try a little bit harder in qualifying. Yeah, for sure. I don't think you're going to see people, um, be more conservative. I think the, you know, Bourdais who really went, uh, for as, as low of a downforce setup as you could possibly do on the 500 and still qualify high. I think you might not necessarily more of that, but you won't see people shy away from that, especially if they're a full-time driver. You might even see somebody crazy like... Uh, uh, who's crazy enough to try? Sage Karam. Let's say Sage Karam is... Uh, you know, he's got one race this year to impress everybody. If that's the Indy 500 and that means he needs to go out and you know, get some crazy setup to qualify up high for the Indy 500, you can be very well sure that he would get that aggressive. Yeah, I think several people get aggressive. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to cut into it, as some people have said. Yeah, for sure. Um, listen, before we uh, end off our, our final, maybe our, our final episode of 2017, uh, is there anything else you wanted to get to? Uh, no, but I do want to say that I hope everybody has happy holidays. Um, I hope you enjoy the time you have with your family and friends. And definitely, um, I wish everybody a good 2018, and we can't wait to keep this thing growing. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully some of your uh, Christmas presents or Hanukkah presents are some... Uh, IndyCar gear of, of sorts or IndyCar tickets to a race this year. Um, yeah, join in the discussion on Twitter. It seems after each episode we get more and more uh, discussion going around the episodes. Uh, again, Twitter and Instagram are both at Pit Lane Parlay. It's P A R L E Y. You get to see our fancy new logos on both of those. Uh, and Facebook, if uh, you, if you do that, is facebook.com slash at pit lane parlay uh check it out we've got the message boards up and running on the website pit lane and uh you know listen thank you to everybody the the follower count seems to be growing more and more each week which is which is really awesome uh i, I you know 
I'm open to talk to anybody about IndyCar if you want to shoot us a message. Uh, I'm always down for a discussion or uh, or a debate if you if you don't agree. You know, I like the opinion. debates. <laughs> yeah, I, and that's that's why uh, that's, that's why you're a good co-host. Um, you know, please debate away or, or agree with me and disagree with Jess. I like that one too. I'm not a fan um, of that one. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> Jess, I will let you sign it off. And as always, keep your lug nuts tight.